Right here? What do you want me to sit here? I'm going to sit right there. Okay. Right there. You want to have a proxy fight over this chair? Or... How about those lights? Can't you put those lights down a little bit? I mean, this is television. Like this a, is how we roll. It's, it's like in a... Uh, it's it's, those, it's uh, great to have you back. Great you know, to they be say here, about I guess sequels, I so say, yeah. great la to be last here, year yeah. was fun. We're going to try and live up to last year, get you to tell a few stories, talk about some stocks, talk about activist investing, sort of in what, you know, really makes you tick in what has become a rather controversial style of investing in, in today's market. Um, I do want to begin, however, with the insider trading investigation and the news which broke, you know, about a <laughs> month or so ago. We spoke shortly after that on the telephone. You told me at that time you had never met Phil Mickelson, that you had never given inside information to anybody, and that you were proud of your record, which you characterized as unblemished in your 40 or 50 years of doing this. Where do we stand today? There's been a lot of silence since then. Where does this stand? Well, I, I would say that everything I told you is correct. Uh, I have to admit I'm getting a little tired of uh, my friends, if that's the operative word, keep sending me emails asking for free golf lessons. And, uh, you know, I don't play golf. I don't know Mickelson, but it seems that, you know, that's the sort of the jokes. I keep getting that. And um, I would just say to you that uh, I really don't want to discuss it any further at this time. And I think I would stand by what you know what what you just said and um, I may uh, give uh, Phil Mickelson a call I've never spoken to him never seen him I may give him a call you know IEP owns a few golf courses so I'll call him and say look I get information for you Phil the information is I'll give you free use of my golf courses and see what he says but I tell you this that uh, I've never met the guy so these things happen I guess and you're just not going to talk about it no, I don't want to. I, I don't want to talk about this talk. Right. Do you do you feel as though, Carl, that activism in general, unrelated to this, just in general, as it's really become prolific over the last year and a half, certainly, and, and further, obviously, is in the crosshairs, that more people are criticizing it, criticizing your style and that of other activist investors? Well, I, I don't know what you mean by uh, criticize it. In, in what way? Well, you know the criticism that's out there from whether it's Marty Lipton, Larry Fink, in some respects, that you guys are only in this for short-term gain, that you're not in it for the long term, that you're not in it for the best interest of the company over the long haul. Yeah, I mean, but that's c completely nonsense because it, let, if you look at our record, IEP, Icon, over the years, I've held companies, ACF, you can walk on our rail cars out of this door all the way to Ohio. I bought it in the middle 80s. We, we made it flourish. We made it work. I own a lot of stocks 10 years, 15 years, 7 years. So, I mean, you know, you can't argue with nonsense. When, 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 you know what? It's a PR machine. They used to say... You know, Icon loses money for shareholders. Well, even they can't say that anymore because we made billions and billions of dollars over the last decade, over the last 20 years. So they can't say that anymore. So now they're saying this. So I can only speak for myself on that point. But on a general point, you know, you have a hegemony. In the, in this country is a hegemony. And it maybe sounds corny, but I do love the country. I'm not so sure I love a lot of the people, but I love the country. So, and, and uh, uh, from my point of view, we're going to lose this because um, in a, these companies we have, with many exceptions, and there are many good companies and many good CEOs, but we generally don't bother them too much. But, but, but the, the problem you have is the wrong guys are running these companies because it's sort of, a, and I will go into the metaphor, I've said it too many times, how the fraternity president works his way up and they like him and boom, 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 and he finally gets, and he's a survivor and he finally moves up the ladder and the guy below him 
he knows to keep a little dumber than him. And he finally gets to be CEO, so the guy below him is always a little dumber. So we're going to have morons running the company soon. And, and we're sort of almost there with many companies. And it's amazing how bad these boards are and these companies are when, when we get into it. Some of the boards, interestingly, want to help and want to do something, but it's a sociological thing. They're friends for years and years with the, uh, uh, with the CEO. They don't want to stand up and say anything, but after we get on for a while, and it happens repeatedly, uh, some of them come around and, and, and look at Forrest. It, it took three years, three and a half years for us to get this going. But you could have bought that stock 35, six months ago. And today, even I was surprised. We got 100, put a new CEO in, got $100 a share for it. And I got real friendly, and I started to respect uh, Howard uh, Solomon, who's the CEO, we have dinner a fair amount. It's funny, and I know this sounds completely uh, strange, and you might not even believe it, but I have a dinner with a lot of these guys afterwards. They they come, we come to sort of respect each other. Not bad guys. A lot of these CEOs are very likable guys. You had, some you had, of them you had dinner, you know, multiple dinners, I think, or at least one with with Tim Cook. Um, so even while you're sort of arguing for, for change and for Apple to do some things, you're still having dinner with the well, guy. They, 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 Tim, uh, yeah, I have dinner with these guys a lot but when is we're it, arguing. But, is but, it but Tim Cook, uh, uh, I think it seems, in my opinion, is doing a good job. I mean, we're not here to uh, discuss that. But there are a lot of them that are. They shouldn't be doing it. They shouldn't be there. And that's where we make so much money. You've maintained to me privately, and I, I think you, you've even said publicly that your, you know, your record speaks for itself. If you want to criticize activism yeah. and how it works and what the end result is, merely look at our record, because we've done pretty darn good in the style of how we've done it. But is there more to it than that, Carl? Is it, is it disruptive to the companies themselves in a negative way? Should Apple, for example, or any company, let's say, with you know, they're sitting on a lot of cash. They're worried about the fundamentals of their business. Shouldn't Apple be more worried about the products in its pipeline and, and things of that nature, rather than an activist investor shaking a big stick at them? I, I don't even understand the question. I don't take that the wrong way, but I, I really don't don't understand it. Look, Apple's a great company. Got great products. Hopefully they'll be coming out with more of great products. I certainly don't know more than you or anybody else out here. I talked to Tim Cook once, I was impressed with him. I obviously believe, and still do, that they should give out that money. They should bring it back, repatriate it, or even borrow very cheaply. When I say give it back, buy back stock. So the shells that like the company would benefit. And if they followed that advice, they would have made more money. But they did follow the advice to some extent. And, and I think they bought a lot of stock back. I think Tim has, I had dinner with him once. I was very impressed with him. I hope that the products that are coming on, they haven't had a product, really new product, a great new product for five years or so. They have this guy Ivy who was still, who's there when Steve Jobs was there. And so therefore, I'm not here to push Apple. No, sure. No, and, and my question, Carl, but, is know. not so Apple specific as more to the idea of short-termism versus long-termism. and. Marty Lipton, for example, who's called you a bully, among other things, uh, and, other, and other things, says that you're only interested in short-term gain in your own interests and not those of the shareholders, despite what you say. I only bring up Apple as yeah, You know, it's example. amazing. It's like saying, I don't like this basketball player because he's too short. The guy says, I'm six foot nine. Why am I too short? Well, he's too short. He's too, I mean, how could he say I'm short-termism when I got these companies for 7, 10, 15, 20 years? But they keep saying it's a mantra. It's like, no matter what you say, it, it's just, you know, it's like a, a, re, a religious zealite that keeps saying, you know, my God is right. Well, how do you prove it? Or so, something like that. It's, it's absurd to dignify it because it's just not true. And you give them the facts and they keep saying it. Well, what the hell can you say? They stop saying, we don't help, share, we don't help shareholders. Even they can't say that when we make billions and billions of dollars. But then ask yourself why I do it. I, look, I think I'm a smart guy, but I'm certainly not a great manager. But you look at our companies, they've all flourished, for well, most of them. You look at it, and what does that tell you? Not that I'm a great manager, it tells you how bad and dysfunctional the system is that I can come in and look for a good guy to run it, and when you find that good guy, you make companies more productive. You make them much more productive. I mean, you know, you say, well, they have too much overhead. 
and oh, isn't it bad to go in and shake the tree, so to speak. But what good does it do to have five guys doing the job one person should do? What good does that do for society? You become a welfare state. You can't have that. And the, even the people that work there don't like it because they're defined. And the CEO's out playing golf. You know, I, I don't go to Mickelson, tell him to talk to these guys, you know? I mean, seriously, they're all out there playing golf. And, and then we come along. I mean, I used to joke, I used to say, the only way you can get one of these guys off the golf course is for me to file a 13D. Because when I file it, suddenly, oh, whoa, we get him on the phone. Good, I'm glad you called. When you first called, they wouldn't know what the secretary would say, this is back 10, 15 years ago, we left. The secretary would say, Icon, Icon who? You know, who are they? Icon. I just tell them, call Icon's caller. I call myself sometimes, just please. I try to be very friendly. Say, just do me a favor. Oh, he won't be back for a week. He's not to be disturbed. I said, just tell him, I'm sure you can disturb him. Well, yes, I know. You know, we're laughing. I know how to get him. Ten minutes later, the phone rings. He's on the phone when I call, okay? Because that's the only way you can get these guys literally off the golf course in many cases. And I want to make very clear there are very good guys around. And I really want to tell you There are plenty of CEOs you like, right? There are guys that I think do a damn good job. There are plenty of them. Yeah, I mean, really. You looked at me kind of funny when I said no. plenty. When you said, what did, I didn't hear what you said. I, 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 said, I don't hear too well. I said you there are, mumble there are, sometime. Okay. I, said, <laughs> <laughs> I said there are plenty of CEOs that you like, right? Yes, yes. I, I thought you looked at me like. funny when I, I said, said plenty. No, yeah, because I thought you said there aren't any. Or something like that. Okay, forget it. There are, plenty that I, there are plenty that I like and think do good jobs. And I respect them. And sometimes you meet the CEO, by the way, as we did at CVI. So we had this big fight with CBI, and look how well we've done there. And do you know we kept the CEO after the fight? We met him, and I really liked him, and I think he's a very capable guy. And in that case, I think the board was at fault. And, and we did stuff, and, and you know, we did stuff that he said, you know, I could never have got this through the board, like the MLP kind of thing. So there's a lot of different, unique situations here. I want to talk more about your style of how you personally do things. Nelson Peltz, you're a good buddy. You've known him for 40 years, he said, backstage, right? That's, I, I would say definitely, I know him 40 years, yeah. On stage, he said of you, Carl's a good friend, but we have a different MO, a very different MO. I don't like to compare myself to anyone else, but we like to get into big companies with great brands, like Pepsi, like Heinz, like Wendy's, and get those companies to build those brands the way they should be, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build them for the long run. We are not trying to make a quick hit over the weekend. Yeah, but... How do you take that kind well, of statement? Well, I, I, I think we could break the sentences up of what he said. I hope he's not saying, because I'll give him a call. We're supposed to have dinner. I'll cancel it. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I'm hoping that what he's saying is he wants to build it up his way, but not that we want to do a quick hit over the weekend. I don't... I hope he's not saying that. I don't think he, he meant that because that's complete nonsense. That's You're not an over-the-weekend kind of guy. I, you know, over the weekend, I'd like to go somewhere with my wife, you know what I mean? But I don't want to, she says I don't travel enough. Maybe that's true. <laughs> I don't think she means I should travel with her, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, last spring, you caught a lot of people, I think, by surprise. You did what many others have been loath to do. Uh, and that's criticized Warren Buffett. You called out Buffett for abstaining yeah. in his vote, or lack thereof, yeah. in Coca-Cola against the, the pay structure. And you wrote an op-ed entitled, Why Warren Buffett is Wrong on Coke. Yeah. What motivated you I, to I, that? Look, I, I made it clear I respect Warren Buffett. And, and, and I like him, and I know him. And, and, and I think he was wrong, definitely wrong, in saying that, you know, you don't want to upset, I don't, the establishment, so to speak. And you, and you know, the board should, you know, and he even said, which is sort of amazing, that uh, there are plenty of things I voted for that I don't agree with. Well, that's not what a board's supposed to do. See, I, and, and even talking about what Pell says, I think the board's job isn't necessarily to micromanage. I'm not going to criticize Nelson about the fact that maybe he is so, and I can't talk about Nelson because I can't know if this is true. I see by his record that some of it might be, that he really is an expert on brands. And in that unique situation, I think that's fine. 
But what a board should be doing is the opposite of what they do, and even what an activist should be doing, is not micromanage. You can't go into companies, Einstein, I don't believe, could go in and go to these board meetings and be on all these boards that people are on and really understand what the hell they're talking about, what they do. These board meetings are a farce to a large extent. And so you thought it was a missed opportunity on Buffett's part, big shareholder Warren yeah. Buffett, by abstaining even though he disagrees, that would have made a statement as far as you're I concerned, think it would if he would have come out and yeah. said, no, this is wrong. And I think, I think he, you know, over the years has pretty much said what I've said about a lot of these CEOs and a lot of these companies. I don't think he's a great fan of a lot of them. But I'm not going to speak for Warren Buffett. I, he, you know, I, and that's not a big issue to me because I do respect Warren. But I will say to you that in our system, we have a real problem. We, we have a real problem in our economic society. That, that what is going on is our companies are not productive enough. I'm the living proof of it. If I can make this kind of money, if I can make this kind of money, I am the proof that there is something wrong. And I'll be the first to say it. Because I can go in, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to say, I'm not a smart guy, and I did well in math and stuff like that. But if you can't, but if you can go into these companies and make the kind of money that we make, we do the strategy, we get in there, there is something wrong, because why isn't the board making, getting, getting the CEO to either produce or get, or get them out? In other words, what a board should do, this is my point, mm -hmm. what a board should do is not tell the CEO what to do. They should leave him alone, really leave him alone. But what they should say, if you're not producing, and they could have a lot of ways to gauge that, which we do, a lot of parameters, and if you're not coming up with and you're not doing as well as your peer group, get off the golf course and get to work and stop worrying about what plane you have. I can't tell you how many CEOs, when we're there, they'll spend 20 minutes talking about, is the Gulf Stream better than the Falcon that we're going to buy? And really, it gets to a point that it's absurd and obscene, maybe. But I think Buffett's point is, in part, I mean, he's like, look, just because you disagree with somebody in his sort of his response to, to you would be like, well, why can't you just talk it out with them behind the scenes? Why do you have to be such a flamethrower? You know, our, our styles, are, I think our style actually would be more effective than the style that might be proposed by Carl, he said. Well, you Just know, a, a clash of, of, of I, styles? I, I, I don't know, you know, if he's saying more effective at Coca-Cola or what he's saying, but I certainly will tell you that I don't, I'll show you all these companies we've gotten all the boards with. They weren't welcoming with open arms at the beginning, maybe later, but I didn't get any invitations from them to come on the board. So. Uh, you know, I don't think they want guys like me on the board because they don't want to be, uh, they don't want the boat rock. Well, they, well I mean, Buffett says CEOs are terrified of activists. Why Do you is that, feel that way? Why is that bad? I mean, if, if a, CEO's, a CEO is doing a good job, isn't terrified of me. Really. They, and they will even say that I've helped them quite a bit. And I'll give you a name. Guys, I still have dinner with Greg Brown of Motorola. He loved me. He, I, I, maybe, I'm, maybe he'll come up and tell you he doesn't. You know, get him on like Pels. I don't know what he'll tell you. Oh, the, we don't want this guy on the weekend. He's a pain in the ass. I mean, I don't know what he'll say. But, 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 but uh, I'm just thinking of him. We liked him. He helped us at Motorola, uh, uh, Greg Brown. I mean, there, there was a, a CEO that was really, that we didn't like. I mean, they didn't welcome us on the board, but we got on. But I, there were many CEOs I like. I mean, hey, you, you I'm sure you're going to bring it up anyway. At Time Warner, we went to Time Warner. We gave them the, the roadmap of what to do. And finally, they did it. And Jeff Bukas came in. And I look, I think he did a very good job. I mean, now, I'm not, I don't know the company well anymore. And I'm not going to opine on whether you know the Fox deal is better or worse for Shell. I'm not going to do that. But I think Jeff will tell you. If you call him, I haven't spoken to him. You know, we, we, we left the company many years ago. But I think Jeff would tell you that we helped, that what we did helped to change things. I couldn't win any proxy fight there. It was a little more difficult then because you have a dysfunctional system and a, large, a lot of large funds don't want to join. Now, it's interesting, a lot of even the large mutual funds are interested in talking to me. They're interested in getting together because they want to beat the index funds. So, but it's still hard to, the hedge funds, of course, will always generally be with me. The, a lot of the funds today, you'd be surprised at the calls I get, 
you know, from some of these funds because they all know, I'm, I hate to say it this way, but they all know to the extent of the company we're talking about that I'm right. Nobody argues when you say they got terrible management in a lot of companies that I'm involved with. Nobody will argue that Family Dollar has a bad is your management is not good there. Look at their record. And yet, why, Pelz do, is on the why board. do you keep them? Pelz is on the board. I mean, he, you know, he, he said today he's not satisfied with, okay, with how things have go. been going. All right. Well, how come he's not putting his brand in there and doing all that magic you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm joking because I think Nelson's a capable guy. Sure. I think he really is. So. You brought up Family Dollar, so, so let's go there. Uh, you've sort of made your intentions well known with Family Dollar. You threatened to throw the whole board out. <laughs> Did Nelson call you about that, by the way? No. No. He's on the board. He can't talk about it. Uh, and I wouldn't expect the, him to. The prospects of this whole scenario have changed a bit. Dollar General, which you wanted Family Dollar to sell itself to, is having a leadership change, which sort of muddies the water, right? The Dollar General CEO is leaving. What happens we're, now? We're, 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 we're disappointed, obviously, in that. You know, sometimes these things take a long time. I mean, I, I, you, you can't... I mean, Marty Lipton didn't say, well, we're here for a weekend thing and, and we, want, we just want a fast payoff. That's not true. I mean, we were in forest for three and a half years and that, you know, sometimes it's long and sometimes it's six, seven years. Uh, you know, I do believe there's great synergy between Dollar General and Family Dollar. I think Family Dollar's management is lacking. But uh, it's obviously somewhat disappointing that you have a very good CEO at Dollar General that's leaving and that might throw a bit of a monkey wrench into a, a merger or take over there, but uh, hey, does, look, does it, it impact you holding the stock? Uh, we don't really talk about stocks we own or don't own. I mean, we own. If we own them, and especially where we have a 13 day out, uh, my lawyers would kill me if I start talking about, you know, what we're going to do with that stock. I would tell you this, I think it's very good long term. And, and it, it's a good long term potential, not with the management, I've said this publicly, but not with the management that you have or with the board that you have. You're still but considering the options that are out there regarding Family Dollar and what you think is best given the change of leadership at Dollar General? Yes. That's fair to say? That's fair to say that we're looking, we always look at strategies and options, but I would tell you that I do think, and I've said it, that Family Dollar is, a, is, is in a good area. It's in a good area with a bad management. And, and, and with a bad, I, you know, I, I've said it publicly, the, the, that the CEO shouldn't be the CEO. And I don't mind saying it. A lot of people do mind saying it. Guys, you know, everybody, people really want to be liked, and so do I, but somehow I talk and some people don't like me. What could I do? I, <laughs> I feel sad about it. But. Let, let me ask you, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're an outspoken guy. And you, you've been pretty outspoken lately in your nervousness, if you will, about how you feel about the stock market, where we are right now. Uh, Stan Druckenmiller was on this very stage earlier today. Uh, he raised the issue of, of the Fed, that the Fed has put too much punch in the punch bowl for far too long, and we're going to pay a price potentially down the road that the risks have only increased that the Fed is growing more and more behind the curve. What, what is your thought as you sit here and you hear what Stan Druckenmiller said? What did said? he say that the Fed is behind, he's worried about The Fed's about behind it. the curve, and the he's, Fed's he's getting worried. more and more behind the curve he's, the longer and, yeah. it stays, and as a result, the risks are increasing. But, you know, I, I'm a, well, my son says this. He doesn't give me much credit most of the time, but he says, but you're a master at being a reductionist, meaning you see a lot of material and then you pinpoint something that's important and that somehow goes click in your brain and it matters. Now, I'll read you something. I wrote it down because I figured you're going to ask me and I have no memory, so I'm going to write, read it. All right. So Janet Yellen, when she talked about monetary policy, somewhere along the way, she said, uh, with monetary policy and the effect on financial vulnerabilities, you know, su such as excessive leverage, et cetera, et cetera, which means derivatives, excessive leverage. And I'm very concerned about the derivatives, I always have been. Uh, Warren Buffett actually called those weapons of mass destruction, but we still have them. Yep. And that's because you've got the cycle that we're in. And, and uh, she says, 
So she says the effect on the financial vulnerabilities, the, the monetary policy, such as stuff like that, are not understood. Now she's saying they're not understood. Don't you worry a little bit? When, I mean, I think Bernanke was great. I think the Fed did a great thing in saving this country, and they did. And who got us into it? Wall Street got us into it, let's face it. I mean, let's not pull punches. Wall Street got us into the mess. They pulled us out. Why they kept some of the management of Wall Street, I sure wouldn't have. If I, if I had been the Secretary of Treasury, you wouldn't see the same management in, in some of these investment banks. Some are very good again, and some aren't. But being that said, if she is saying that, then there's not an argument, right? You have to worry about the excessive printing of money. And you, because you don't know, it's like having a patient, you know? And the patient is there, maybe getting better, but you keep giving them this medicine and you say to the doctors, well, what is that medicine gonna do? You know, maybe it's steroids of some type. What are it gonna do? So we really don't know what it's gonna do. But it seems to be making them better and happier, so we're gonna keep giving to them. Well, what if he just blows up and dies one day? Well, we don't know. And that's really what she's saying. But we keep doing this. And I really think that it's artificial what's going on. And what we should be doing, and I get back to the old saw, is worrying about our productivity and worrying about who runs these great industries that we have. And who are the CEOs that we entrust them to. If, if you look at many of the companies I'm in, when I went into them and are in now, I mean, I'm just talking about one thing. I don't mean to pick on one or another, but sure. it's easier because I'm in it. If you inherited family dollar and your uncle gave it to you, you would keep that CEO for three days. I mean, everybody would say that. You wouldn't keep him. I mean, he's not a bad guy. I met him. I had dinner with him. Nice guy. But I'm saying that's what we should be doing. We should be worrying about who runs our companies rather than just keep printing the money. Hey, if you keep printing our money, and I'll get me going on this, and, and you keep giving guys money at three or four percent, even an idiot can take that three percent money in a company and has a gross margin of eight or nine percent and keep investing it and make it nine and say, geez, look how good my earnings are. Until one day, all that money is borrowing on a variable rate, which they are, borrowing variable rates, one day it starts going up and up and up and I, who's to say you don't have inflation already? And when it goes up, especially these guys are going to be able to meet that challenge. And that is what I'm saying. Are, are you being more selective as a result in the kind of stocks you're buying and the kind of companies you're being involved with now? Yeah, because of look, your concern? I, I have to tell you this, that uh, IEP, and I've said it before, and it's public, has a great record, which proves, which proves, that's one of the reasons I talk about it, it proves that activism works. But here's my point to you, that if you bought that stock in 2000, I mean, just to prove about the activism, you're up, uh, you're, you're up about annualized, and you just, as opposed to putting the bank, if you bought the hedge fund index at the same moment in time, over those period of times annualized, you'd be up about 22% annually. Hedge fund index, 4%, okay? And over the last five years, it's even better. You'd be up about 36% annualized. But the beauty of what I'm saying, and why I am proud of this is, threw it out, We've been extremely hedged. If I didn't have the hedge on, if I didn't have the shorts on, we'd be up, instead of the 22%, close to 38 or 40, if we were long only. Okay, that proves this works. But it also proves how nervous I am about the market. And I try to keep, but, I, but it, it's never gonna be fully hedged. But at IEP, I try to keep a major hedge on, because I am very nervous. And I think one day, and you don't know when, and I really mean this, it could be, 10 years, it could be 10 days, I worry about the fact that what Janet Yellen says, I'm just reducing it. If she doesn't know what effects it's gonna have, how the hell do I know? How does anybody out here know? And, and how does any analyst know? And yet we keep doing it. And the economy doesn't seem to be doing all that great. And look at the guys you have running the, 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 the companies in the economy. So I mean, you could go on and on with that. Let, let me ask you about one stock in particular that we haven't spoken about all that recently that I haven't heard you speak on publicly in quite a while and that's Herbalife. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot going on around Herbalife. Things have sort of died down behind the scenes of these investigations that have been going on in various corners of this country. You're still in Herbalife. You, you still I, I, believe I, I, let, in that let story? Let me sort of cut it short a little bit. I, I, uh, 
I'm not on the board, but we have representatives on the board, and I have a confidentiality. So I can't really talk about herbal life, and not because I'm trying to hide anything, but because, you know, we're in a quiet period anyway, because earnings are coming out. So it's the worst time for me to talk about herbal life, and I just can't talk about it. But I will say one thing that, uh, that we bought, and I'm proud of it, we bought 17 million shares at an average of 37, uh, and we haven't sold one share. Now that's all I can say, and I think we have to drop it there. Okay. Okay. But you know, <laughs> you know who's on the other side of that, of course. We've we've been I, down that. I road might have bought it from him. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I wonder what he thinks about sort of where we are now. Um, why don't we ask him, Bill Ackman, ladies and gentlemen. Carl. Hey, hey, good. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> I wouldn't have said about Herbal Life after I knew it standing on there. <laughs> Bill Ackman of Pershing Square. And of course, we do have a couple of things we had made up for this, this event. Um, everybody obviously knows what happened uh, about 18 months ago live on CNBC, which was, was quite a moment for everybody involved. Uh, so we decided to have a couple of shirts made up, one for each of you. Bill and Carl reunited. <laughs> And on the back, it feels so good with delivering Alpha the logo. So, Bill, I'm going to present you with one. You. And Carl, one for you as well. I hope it's extra large. Extra large. It's extra large, yeah. Okay. No offense. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Sure. How in the world did this happen? How are you guys reunited on this stage after what happened on live television nearly 18 months ago? Look, what I would say is... Uh, I respect Carl's story, right? He talks about, actually he talked about in our interview, uh, his kind of, uh, I had a huge head start versus Carl in terms of my, uh, grew up in an affluent community, uh, went to great uh, public schools, had a great education. Uh, Carl got a, a little rougher start. A little tougher. A little, a little tougher, tougher start. Yeah. And he's done incredibly well over a very long period of time, and you have to respect that record. We had a business dispute 10 years ago. It took eight years to work it out. You know, Carl is as persistent as I am, right? So, uh, yeah, I was a little annoyed with him on our, you know, again, the way you sold this to me is, Bill, 15 minutes to respond to Carl. I'll call you in your office, everything's fine. Now, you did surprise me with Carl, so it's my turn to surprise Carl, I guess, uh, <laughs> today. But look, he was uh, actually thoughtful and supportive of what we're working on with Valiant on the Allergan situation, and, and I, frankly complimentary, and I thought that was kind of big of him. That changed the way you thought? And so I called him and thanked him, and uh, actually I called his ass an assistant picked up, and he wasn't in the office, and I said, tell Carl I'm calling to forgive him. And, uh, <laughs> and that was a true story, and, he, and she said, oh, you know, I think he'll really like that. And uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, he called me later that uh, afternoon, and we chatted for 45 minutes, and you know, what we talked about, we moved beyond Herbal Life in about 30 seconds, and, and uh, you know, I've listened to Carl's uh, interview, uh, but where we share a lot of commonality uh, is the importance of the shareholder's ability to have a voice uh, in the way a business is being managed. It's and, funny, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about how we were going to have this conversation and, and contrasting your styles as to whether, Carl, this was activism, old school, new school, or if the irony of the whole thing here is that you guys are from the same school when it comes to activism and what you're trying to accomplish. Is that true, Carl? Would you, would you say that? Yeah, I do. I, I think, and that's one of the uh, reasons I, I do respect Bill. And you know, I was thinking about it before Bill called. I said, you know, it's almost crazy that we're at these loggerheads because I've you know, heard you say different things about different companies, and, you, and you're one of the few guys that really does speak out and say if you don't like the guy, you know, you know. And there aren't too many activists that do that. And I said, you know, I respect what he said here and there. I mean, what the hell am I fighting so much for? And then you called, and I said, hey, great. I called him back and said, it's blessed to forgive, you know, and that's how we left it. And that was pretty much it. So what, what Bill, you know, I guess it, asking you to be a little introspective here, what, you've watched Carl's career, as before you wanted to be an activist investor, when you were probably thinking about being a hedge fund manager, you must have known about Carl. Are there things that you have seen over the years or have, uh, or respect in his style of what he's done, have learned from how to deal with companies, how to go into adversarial situations from an activist and come out on the other side a winner? 
I would say we have a different approach, but I think what I respect about Carl is he says what he thinks. And to his point, uh, there are a lot of people who are not prepared to you know, stand their ground, speak their opinion, say some things that might be uncomfortable for other people to hear. Uh, you know, it's, uh, that's important. And in a world, if you think about the capital markets, 100 years ago, you know, Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, uh, these guys would own, you know, 20% of U.S. Steel. And if the CEO wasn't doing a good job, you know, the owner would step in, replace the CEO, or replace the board. Uh, and what happened in over 100 years is Andrew Carnegie's heir, he didn't have heirs, I guess he gave all his money away. You had the growth of the mutual fund industry. Uh, and the vast majority of capital today is passively managed. Uh, extremely passively, if you think about it, an ETF. I mean, who really owns an ETF? It's mm -hmm. just a trading sardine, right? Index funds track an index. Uh, and you have this huge separation between the people who put up the capital and the people making decisions at the, at the corporate level. And that distance creates risk. You know, if you look at Japan, you know, I think of the, the inefficiencies in the Japanese economy, the 20-year uh, recession, worst recession that they're trying to dig themselves out of, I think a lot of that has to do with the governance structure and the cross-ownership and the inability for the owners to have a voice. And so, what, what I, you know, if you think about Carl Icahn 1.0, which I, I, I watched, you know, in the 80s when I was, uh, you know, in college, you know, and the, what, what happened was, uh, it was really Mike Milken that gave capital to entrepreneurial investors that put them in a position where they could take an underperforming company and threaten it with a change of control. Uh, but that was more, in that model, Carl was more about him, and not, it was helpful to the other shareholders if he catalyzed change, but you know, sometimes Carl walked away with a profit when he got bought out by a CEO who just wanted to get rid of him. What changed in Carl Icahn 2.0, and I think what we've liked about shareholder activism, I've been an activist since 92 when I went into the business, is that the only way Carl is successful is if all of the other shareholders benefit along with him. And Carl's not going to be successful if the other shareholders, you know, if Carl owns 9% of whatever company, or 5% or 6%, family dollar, make up the name, unless he has the support of the other holders, he's not going to succeed. And I think a very good system in a world with a lot of passive investors is one in which there are at least a few entrepreneurial investors prepared to say what they think, prepared to propose a change in management, a change in strategy, a change in cost structure, capital structure. And it's just a, it's, a, it's floating a trial balloon. You know, now Carl's trial balloons are bigger than other people's trial balloons. They're louder when they pop. But the, and the point I would make is uh, he needs the backing of the institutions, the retail investors, in order to succeed. If he doesn't get it, you know, now without Carl, there is no proposal. He may agree or disagree with his ideas, but I think it's a very healthy thing for the capital markets, for the so-called shareholder activists. You know, we were able to convince the shareholders of Canadian Pacific to support our new management team. If we were unsuccessful, you know, we would, we would have to go home. Uh, and so it's a strategy where uh, I think there is very little downside uh, because again, the public, you know, the, the major shareholders have to support the activists, otherwise the activist fails. Carl, what would you add to that? Yeah, I, I think on a, on a more general uh, level, the, the, there's a real problem in our economy related to what Bill just talked about. And, and, he, and he made the point just now about Andrew Carnegie. So Carnegie, if he, if, he, if he had a company and the CEO wasn't doing well, it would take two days, you'd get rid of him. Today, you've got CEOs there that you can't get rid of. Now, what does that mean? So who's going to really suffer by this? And the people that are going to suffer is the middle class guy or the lower middle class guy, and I'm going to tell you why. Because the Archie Bunkers of the world are thinking they've still got a pension fund. But I'll tell you, these pension funds, most of them are not run well. You think they run well, but they're not. And if you just uh, read something like what Dalio said in his studies on pension funds, I just read it the other day maybe, if you look at the numbers, that they're saying it's something that's sort of horrendous, and I don't want to really quote the thing because I read it a while back, but again, it's my reductionist thing. You know, I read these fast. But if you look at this, looking ahead 10 years or 20 years, these, these pension funds are going to go bankrupt. They can't make it because they're assuming that they can make a 9% return and they're only making 4% return even in these markets. And these markets are real good. So the the poor guy in the middle class, lower middle class, that believes he has a pension fund, doesn't really have one, maybe. Because if they go broke, then you're gonna rely on the government to bail out the pension plan. And if you look at the makeup demographically, you're gonna have, I believe, a, a construct in Washington 
where they're not necessarily going to care about bailing out these guys. You know, now people are voting, and, 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 and you look 20 years from now, those that are voting and electing the senators and the congressmen that have to decide to bail them out aren't going to want to bail these guys out. So you've got a real problem, and we're not doing anything about it. Bill made a good point, too. You, you have these ETFs, index funds. Maybe they'll give lip service to the fact that they really care about, you know, how these companies are run. But, but you know, basically, they're buying the index. They're just buying the S&P. If it goes up and down, they're still getting their uh, non uh, percent. That's why it's a little better today with the mutual fund. But what you really have today are very mediocre managements in many companies, and that is your real problem. Uh, I, I, I was reading uh, the Wall Street Journal over the weekend on a book review, on, and, and, and it's interesting. Uh, Bill Gates said in that book review, um, and he said, uh, he asked Warren Buffett what was the best business book he ever read, and he said, it was, the name of it was, and I wrote it down because I tell you I can't remember the exact thing, but, but it's a book that I, myself, um, that I myself read years ago in the 60s. And it's, it was by John Brooks, a guy named John Brooks. Some people heard of, some didn't. But there was one thing in the book that was really interesting, and I remember from years and years back from the 60s, but it still is true today. And, you know, maybe it's said a different way. But anyway, Gates said it was the best book he ever read. It, it, it's um, Business Adventures by, by John Brooks. And he said something like this, but it's hard, you know, I'm taking it out of context. But anyway, it doesn't matter if you have a perfect product and if you have great production. I'm paraphrasing, I can't read my hand right. And, and if you have a great marketing, but what you need is the right people to run and lead your company. And, that says it all. You need the right person to run a company. You don't need the board to run the company. In fact, it's a negative. The board, I, listen, I'm, I'm on all these boards. I, I hate going to board meetings, and I try to put delegates on, because the board meetings are something out of Saturday Night Live, for the most part. And, and again, there's some good boards, but it's sort of Saturday Night Live. Each guy comes up with his little idea. You know, it's this idea, that idea. and. Uh, to digress, I'll tell you sort of a funny story. I don't know if I can use curse words, or maybe you can't because you're don't on use TV. Curse words. I won't use a curse word, so I'll just if leave a can, dash. If you can help us. I'll, I'll help it. So we had this. Uh, they actually have Carl on like a three or four second delay. I was, I was watching the TV in the back just to make sure. <laughs> so make sure we're safe. You can bleep him out. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you can bleep so out my curse word. You can say whatever you want. The live yeah. audience gets to hear it. Okay. So, <laughs> I, but this sort, of, this sort of says it all. This says it all. Well, can I bleep it out or you don't want to? I, they'll laugh more, but it don't matter. It don't matter. I, 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 I don't want to spend too much time. I want to, but, but this says it all, really, how, what do I believe. I don't believe in micromanaging. I believe that the board should stay the hell out of it, for the most part, about your ideas, unless you're a Nobel Prize winner in a biotech company, or unless you really are extremely knowledgeable in the food company or something like that. What you want is the board to hold them accountable. So one day, I had of a board at IEP. We're going back quite a while, maybe 10 years or something. So we had Stratosphere Casino that we bought out of bankruptcy. And the board is there and all that. And one of the members of the board, I'm still friendly with, still on my board, sort of a powerful guy, you know, and he booms stuff out. And he comes up, Carl, I got this great idea, because everybody got an idea for a casino. And he says, I got this great idea at the Strat. We have this room, room like this size. Well, make it into the Copacabana. I said, that sounds like a damn good idea. Because, you know, we're two old guys. Are, hey, the Copacabana used to be fun. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. We got this empty space. I said, OK. So he goes out and gets the architects. They're working on the plan. Now, I brought in a CEO, a tough meat and potatoes guy, because that's what the stratosphere needed. The stratosphere was terribly run. It went bankrupt. You know, first of all, it spent too much money. They were trying to be what they're not. So I got this meat and potatoes guy who was doing a real good job. You know, he's, he's cutting the hell out of the course and making us money. So I called him up and said, we want to come out and see you, Rich. We have an idea. He says, OK, Carl. OK, Mr. Icon. He calls Mr. Icon. He said, you know, down to earth guy. And my buddy, the, the board comes with the plans of these two architects all dressed up real nice. And he comes out. We put this plan out, and we're all smiling. Look at this great idea. And Rich keeps looking and looking. I said, wait a minute. Hold everything. I said, Rich, I promised you when I brought you in, because I brought him in from another casino. 
I promised you I'm not going to micromanage, especially when you're doing so well. So tell me the truth. What do you think of the idea? And everybody's staring at him. And he says, dumbest F idea I ever heard. And he says, and I looked that I reached over and I tore up the plans. And that's how you should run a company. Let the CEO run it. Don't interfere with him unless he's doing badly. Or, obviously, unless you've got secular changes coming on. When you have secular change, when you have major things that you have to do, or raise capital, that's what we do. We raise capital, make sure the CEO is meeting the numbers. There is a time, though, when the board needs to get involved. When, I know you disagree with this a little bit. No, 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 no. By the way, I 100% agree with everything you're saying. Okay. Find the right guy, put him in place, let him run the company. Yeah. And by the way, you know, David Weinreb runs Howard Hughes Corporation. He's done an unbelievable job. Hunter Harrison running Canadian Pacific. I never call Hunter. Okay. Right? If Hunter needs me for anything, I'm available. If David Weinreb okay. needs me, I'm available. Okay, so but there is a time, where I'm 100%, uh, is a company, someone makes an acquisition offer at a 50% premium. Exactly. I just said that. When you're going to do a... a <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Yeah, if one of my guys wants to make an acquisition and he's a CEO, he ain't doing it without us saying, okay. But that's different. That's not really operating. It's, it fits in, but we have to fit in financially. Or, or and we're the finance. Look, I, I'll say this at the risk of being modest. There's nobody better at finance than us. I mean, guys here that made all this money, we're going to tell, hey, how do you borrow the money? Do you do it? Where's the future? Now you look 10 years away. Is there secular change coming? That's where we come in. But you don't come in in telling him how to run his company, how to 100%. build a factory. Do you want to build it here, you want to build it there, or do you want to build it at all? We don't tell him. We said, go do it. Yeah. I mean, we're just doing something. The guy just needed 250 million. It took me three minutes. The guy's doing a good job. We're getting you the 250. We think you need it. Bill, you That's alluded enemy. to this a, a, a bit uh, ago, that you, know, you may be after the same things, but your styles are, are different. And you, as well, have faced criticism about your style of activism. I know you're not that fond of some of the things that Marty Lipton has said about <laughs> activism. Maybe he said them specifically about you. He certainly said things about Carl. What, what's your response to, to all of that? Your style, how activism is? What's interesting is uh, actually for the first seven or eight years of our business, Marty Lipton was incredibly supportive of what we do. Um, I don't know if, why, why he's changed or have, whether he's changed, but what I would say is um, there is not a shareholder that I'm aware of uh, that is critical of, uh, again, Marty Lipton is not an investor in any of these companies. He runs a legal firm, right? They give advice to uh, management teams that try to protect themselves from people like me and Carl, right? So he's got a franchise, he's marketing, right? He's become the spokesperson for uh, legal defense practices. Call Marty when, when Carl shows up, yeah. right? So I think, you know, Marty should be sending royalty checks uh, to Carl, you know? So I think, <laughs> and, and, I, and I, maybe I deserve a few also, but the, um, so, uh, look, I think what matters is uh, the companies we've taken stakes in over time, okay? And again, there are going to be exceptions, JCPenney being a very glaring uh, example, but I think, you know, our batting average is about 27 for 30. Uh, target borders, JCPenney. Uh, target, you know, they, our advice was get out of the credit card business. You know, the CEO lost his job recently because of a business they chose to retain instead of exit. But uh, putting that aside, uh, ultimately the stock... Uh, uh, but three retail disappointments. In the other cases, we made a fortune not just while we own the stock, but even after we exited. I mean, I think the best test of an activist is not just how the stock does while they own it, right? So we, you know, we exited general growth. You know, it's a 140-fold return for shareholders. Uh, stock's up 10%, 15% since we sold it uh, a few months ago. We want the businesses we own to thrive after we exit. I think it's a very, very good example. But again, we're not successful without the support of the institutions. But when I mentioned index funds before, I wasn't critical. I think index funds are an ideal product, a great way for people to invest money very cost effectively. The problem is that there's no one at an index fund is gonna put forth a proposal on changing management or changing strategy. And in fact, there's very few people, if any, at big institutions. Uh, you know, when you talk to the big institutions, for example, in Allergan, we've had a lot of the major shareholders come to us and say, you know, we're incredibly supportive of this deal. We can't get the board, ret you know, to return our phone call. But, you know, generally, uh, you know, we're not, we're not going to say anything publicly because we manage a lot of 401k money. And if we become activists or perceived to be activists, we're going to lose a huge amount of capital that we manage for these big corporations. And so the reason why activists are entrepreneurs is because Carl doesn't have to report to anyone and he can say what he thinks. You know, we, we're a private business. You know, I, I, we, can, we can speak the truth without fear of, you know, uh, losing a 401k account. 
and, and just to add to that, what I think what Bill said, that if you, if you look at IEP, so just get it in to prove the point, really prove it. So I'll just take a few of the companies. I mean, as well as we've done in the market and buying stocks and maybe selling them and getting them taken over. So back in 2000, we went out and bought four little oil companies that were terribly run, put them together. Six years later, those oil companies, we put a two, three hundred million, IEP was in it and all. We sold it for a billion five. And it wouldn't have been done if, if and I'll say this, the risk of being a must, if we weren't there. And the same with the casinos. I mean, there's another example. We bought these casinos that were sort of bankrupt, fixed them up, and did it with management. And we're not managers. I want to be the first to say that. So, so I, I think, you know, a little grain of salt when, all, when the hedge fund guys suddenly come in and say, oh, we're going to go tell them what to do, or we're going to help them. I mean, there may be cases where that's an exception, you know, with an exception, but I don't really buy it. I, I buy the fact that what you do is bring in a top guy in that area and let him do it. And we've done it many, many times. So we, we brought in guys in all these companies. We've been really good. Look at Chesapeake. There's a perfect example of Chesapeake. They said to us, oh, it's a mistake. You can't really, if Aubrey, and we like Aubrey. I like Aubrey Blucani. He's had dinner with me three, four times in my apartment. But he wasn't the guy for a lot of reasons. I'm not going to go into bad Aubrey. They said, you can't change the culture. You'll fail. You can't change the culture. And the stock was like 15, 16, 17. We brought in this guy, great guy, Doug Lawler. We brought him in. We don't tell him what to do. He went in. He's cleaned it up. That stock is up from 15 to 30. And the oil market hasn't changed that much. It's just put in the right person to run it. That is a simple answer. And that's what we have to do for our society, by the way. I mean, make it in a bigger... But before we go, Bill, um, news today, more of it, uh, on the aforementioned Allergan. Uh, you wrote a new letter telling them, stop delaying this, this special meeting. What's going to happen? Is the, is the deal going to happen? I think the deal's John Paulson was on this stage today. He's a shareholder in Allergan, said he best thing would be for that deal to happen. Thinks it will. Eventually, I've written very few critical letters of boards of directors in 10 years. Very few. Uh, could be maybe three uh, in the history of the firm. Um, what's going on in Allergan, I think, is unprecedented for a company with a $50 billion market cap, which is Valiant's made a 50% premium offer for the business. Uh, the shareholders are clearly interested in, at a minimum, negotiating or learning more about this offer. Uh, the board has refused to have a meeting with Valiant. Okay, you can say fine, they don't want to have a meeting. But their response to the Valiant bid was to attack Valiant, call it a house of cards, uh, accuse it of accounting fraud, um, you know, and without basis. With, you know, so my understanding of market, you know, if I went public and said, uh, this company is an accounting fraud, uh, this company is, uh, you know, has, you know the, the organic growth numbers they're putting out are totally false, and I didn't have a factual basis for that to prove those kind of allegations, I would, the SEC would be all over that. Right? Meanwhile, you have a public company, $50 billion market cap, 50% or more of their shareholders actually own Valiant stock, including their, some of their largest holders. T. Rowe Price is a major shareholder of Allergan and a major shareholder of, of Valiant. And the board of this company is attacking uh, the Valiant currency as a way to defend the company. And I just think it's completely inappropriate, possibly illegal. Uh, and uh, what they should do, by the way, so they're, what they're, what's unusual about Allergan, which is very dangerous, is they put in place bylaws. So shareholders push for a special meeting provision. Why are special meeting provisions important? Because if a deal comes along and there's no ability and the board won't respond and puts in place a poison pill, uh, the, the shareholders can't do anything until the next annual meeting, which is a year away, mm -hmm. right? Where, so the shareholders asked for a special meeting provision. It was put in place. And what did Allergan do? They said, well, number one, instead of a 10% vote to call a special meeting, you need a 25% vote. And by the way, we put in a pill at 10%. And in order to get the 25%, we require you to solicit all of our shareholders, which is going to take you, you know, a couple months. And by the way, we're, going to, uh, we're only going to allow you to hold this meeting uh, not, not within 90 days of the anniversary of the annual meeting. We can delay for 120 days. You've got to fill out a whole long length of uh, documents in order to submit proposals, make it incredibly difficult for people to call a meeting. You can only call one a year. You can only call it between October and February, right? Well, what are they afraid of, right? Valiant's made an offer to acquire the company. They said, look, we're actually willing to pay a little bit more. We're willing to negotiate a deal if the board will come to the table now. It's a deal that $72 a share in cash, but 44% of the combined company can be owned by Allergan. 
How can the board say the deal grossly undervalues the company if they don't analyze Valiant? If, you know, instead, what they've done is attack the company. And um, the good news is that the shareholders have been very supportive. 90% of the stock has changed hands. A lot of the long-only long investors don't believe the company's worth where the stock is trading today unless the deal happens and they're not risk arbitrageurs. Uh, so ultimately, I think the transaction happens and the right thing for the board to do, sit down with Valiant, ask if they have any questions about the company's accounting, bring in their accountants, have them meet with uh, Valiant's auditors, ask the CFO questions, ask, you know, look, ask for support for the organic growth numbers. If they have any doubt about the business, they should do that kind of due diligence. We'll make that the last word, except for one thing. <laughs> this Herbalife story, who's going to win? It's not, it's not about winning. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end. It's not about winning. Look, I, I would love to find a way to get Carl out of this stock. He's bought 17 million shares at $32 a share, right? Uh, he can get out a very nice profit. Uh, I'd like him to walk away with a profit. Uh, and uh, that would be a great outcome for Carl. Uh, and uh, that would be wonderful for us. And so, uh, you know, Carl, maybe we should have a conversation. Uh, maybe you will. Uh, well, I can speak on behalf of everybody here. This has been wonderful.